five things that are holding back your painting, things that you can stop doing and start doing. Get your bag rats, chuck it on there, job done. But now I'm looking for a bit more refinement, a little bit more control. A wash isn't always the fastest, quickest and easiest way to shade a model. Once I really locked that in, that created a huge change in the quality on inches. I felt like I'd unlocked like some magical power. <laughs> My mind is kind of blown. <laughs> <laughs>
I, I it's just fine. Uh, you can do what you want. I, I just won't be here to pick up the pieces yeah. when when you I'm cry. Not, about I'm not going to correct you. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, if you want to mess them up, you can mess them up. It's That's fine. fine. You're yeah. Not mine. They're it's, yours. It's not been like that at all. It's <laughs> so so yeah. I just want to mm. put the land as level as it should be because things aren't um, things aren't sort of been. I haven't been steering at all, other than one as passing be, right? one passing comment, which I think is yeah. the way to do it. You no, know? no, it'd be fair. So, well. So, for, yeah. Further hobby updates. Yeah. It's June Steeler Colts. Hashtag June Steeler Colts. That's our monthly painting challenge this month in June. You can paint anything June Steel, <laughs> anything Gene Steeler related, uh, and submit it to the show, and we'll do a little roundup at the end. Uh, I've started on the Brood Brothers from the new Kill Team box, which mm. GW kindly sent us for a review. Uh, nice. I've only I literally started them last night, so there's not a lot of progress. I'll be honest, but. Uh, Think I'm further once you, once again further along than James, <laughs> who said he was going to do. Was it, you said you were going to do Calamorph, then you weren't going to do no, Calamorph. No, no. You, you, I tell you what, he does love twisting twisting well, information, doesn't he? Like it's because he's the head. He, he's he's beating you. As I've he's said, head. He can, he's got the right to twist a little bit. As I said, what happens in many occasions where people talk the talk and then mm. don't walk the walk? I'm keeping quiet. And then I will, I will. And then you won't finish anything. And everyone <laughs> in the comments will go, I can't believe James did finish again. I'm not setting myself, I'm not setting myself up for a downfall. And I'm not, um, I'm not giving it, giving it the OG saying, I'll oh, get all this stuff done. Or well, whatever. I haven't painted any. So look. Yeah, but that's because, go. that's because last week you splurged so many things out that you'd done. Yeah, 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 it was like, it was like it. last week when we done the hobby update to Paul. It's like we pulled a string and just let him go for 10 minutes. Uh, yeah. I've, yeah. Since then I've done nothing. <laughs> <laughs> it's right, good. I, I've done a little bit of painting, but I haven't got any jeans stealers to paint. So, oh, I'm sure we can know. sort that out for you, Paul. Uh, like, yeah. yeah, maybe. I, I'm not really keen on jeans stealers. Do you not? I like the jeans stealer cult, the little cultist fellas. They're oh, okay, yeah, cult, those but not jeans stealers. No, I just can, don't. We, you, you can give you a cult. I don't butter my cracker. <laughs> Is that that's a that's a that's, a, <laughs> that's what the kids say, isn't it? <laughs> Did I pass you my James's book? Yeah, yeah no, um, uh, no, but yeah, they, they are great models. The uh, the the is it the acolytes? These are the acolytes. Mm, yeah, they they yeah, really they're, they're great. Um, yeah, I I've already seen Discord that someone has said get I've got a poll or vote going as to whether I'll get the one that I'm going to get done by the end of the month. We'll see. Yeah. I'm going to try. I have lots Fox of commitments. James. I have lots of commitments. I want to see at Siege, the, uh... and I have lots of commitments outside of work. So, wow, you know, it doesn't count, I've got does two it? very very needy dogs. I've got, you know, a lot of things that I need to to do outside of work. Mm. Um so but I'll try. I'll absolutely try my damnedest to get to get the uh abhorrent done. Um cuz I really really I do really genuinely I want to see you paint the me the mega mind as well. I want the mega mind. Oh yeah. Yeah. I'm not. I haven't got time to paint the mega mind. Well, it's always time, is it? <laughs> you, you just—it's poor time management. That's I've what got it's down to. Yeah. We've got. He's a, that's a skill issue. Time management. <laughs> yeah, that's a skill issue. <laughs> I try and be as a fit. I, I, I actually for for all the stuff I have to do, I'm I'm not too bad for for that. But um, but mm. uh, but no, I've got a class coming up this weekend. Um, at Elements, so I've got that to to sort out as well. So there's there's just a lot of things. Yeah, a lot of things that um that are like on the to do list and. I, I hope to be able to to get to step up for June Steeler this month. I'm not committing. That's not me committing or saying I will. I'm oh, saying it sounds like. I do, do you know what? <laughs> That's I'm what like, I heard. Thing is, the thing is, I've already figured out a, a, a way to kind of like in in true honour of like last month's where that chap painted the rear of the Redemptor with the cog symbol. I've already figured something mm. out that I can do that will work for the this whole month. the whole point of these monthly challenges we almost encourage rule twisting. The idea is you just paint something. It can be a little dead Gene Steeler cult's head. On a That's base right. of your tyrannids, if you That's want. Right. So, how many challenges have you completed this um, year? Oh, that brings a grand total to zero. No, I have. <laughs> I have completed. No, I've done the corn one. For the, I've done the 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 chaos one with the corn base of the corn uh, berserker. I did that one. I don't think that was on time. It was on time. I don't. Well, I'm staying out of that one. <laughs> but but uh, so yeah, zero I'm putting, six. My, I'm putting my towel down on the beach. I definitely, definitely, definitely done that okay. one in time. So, so what's next? even if I didn't, I still did. <laughs> <laughs> So you're not allowed to do any painting until the, the relevant month. No, I, well I can do. Yeah, I've got. So I've, you I've can't got a like lot. I've got July. I've, whatever I've got, the month, what are you ever going to do? You can't start now. Uh, July is going to be hashtag Jew Legion. So you can paint anything. So you, you can like. paint anything. Yeah. Uh, oh, Legions, Space yeah. Marines. Okay. Yeah. So I mean, we'll be fine. But I'll just um, yeah. sure. I, it'll be fine. I've already figured out something that I can do if I don't get the time to finish the abhorrent. So you know yeah. he's got you know he's got that little guy that's leaning round. Going, yeah, you're just going to do him. I might do him. Yeah. That's, if I can't get that's the big point point four of a miniature, isn't it? Because yeah. that's all on one base, so that's one miniature. It's, technically, it is a miniature. Well, 
Point four. That doesn't really count, does it? <laughs> he's literally cling isn't he clinging on to the abhorrent as he's looking around. No, he's hang on, hang on. This is this is a definitive factor. Does he have his own base? No, he's on the base with the abhorrent. Do no, that's not whole miniature then, is it? No. Well, I consider it. I consider it a whole miniature. <laughs> no, if he was that small and had his own hey, base, look, I'd we, we always go on, on on this podcast. We always go on about you know, do it your way. You should paint for do your. Do it your yeah. You paint that gets you thing. around an awful lot, yeah, doesn't it? Yeah. yeah. So yeah. I'm doing it my way. So so there you go. You <laughs> yeah, know, do um, it your way unless you're do wrong. Do it your yeah. way. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So so that's what we're going to be going for. Paint, uh, so I could paint a grenade that has come off of a Jean Steeler. No, no, that's pout. that's too close to the line. No, it needs to be It's my way. No, but it needs to be something that's relevant relevant to the month. So like the reason hmm. why Hang on, hang on. If it was a web if it was a gene stealer specific grenade that wasn't <laughs> didn't look like something that was on, you know, any I think other grenades thing. a bit generic, but if it was like yeah. a specific weapon, for example, if it was Eldar well, so, and you'd done an Eldar weapon, that's unique. So the gene stealer cults have got a Weber pistol, which is a really old gun from second edition. They're yeah. the first ones to get it back in, in like tenth or like new models. So you could theoretically paint so a we'll web, paint Weber pistol on a base. And it's a gene stealer cult weapon. Wow. Challenge could, complete. That would still be more than you yeah <laughs> one nil yeah, <laughs> yeah. I'll, I'll give you the i'll give you the w on that paul if you do, yeah. you do a gene steel what, if weapon, he sticks a weber then... pistol on a base yeah that's fine by me that's more than you're doing right well i'm gonna cut that little guy off that abhorrent base and stick him on a base then <laughs> that would be more in the spirit of the challenge i would yeah, accept that put him on a little 25 mil and call it a day yeah i think that's what we'll do okay i think i might do that because that'll sure. be that'll be an easier easier win no, we'll see i'm gonna try it's I'm gonna not try. about winning it's about taking part no it's absolutely about winning it's about winning the wrong so how many have you completed i think i've done all of them bar last month. I think we're oh, going to okay. need to fact check this because I don't think okay. I don't think that's true. Well, we'll take that. And also, I'm going to add this in there as well. The one, if it if it was in time, my corn berserker on the month that we did that, <laughs> I painted the full model. I think um, I think some uh, some some well, no no uh, I think some clever, over clever to the next front month, front on photography was uh, was used on a certain. You certain didn't paint the back though, surely. I painted the full model 360. Yeah. Others, <laughs> some might say. <laughs> Might have only painted the front, but we'll, I don't we'll, remember there being any rules about painting the back of a model. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we'll see. We'll see. Okay, a quick little PSA before we get into the listeners' comments. If you head to the description of this episode, you'll find a link to the Siege Studios newsletter. And we have a new reward. So if you're a new person to sign up and enter your email address, then you'll get a free PDF, which is normally exclusive to our Patreon members. And also, if you sign up to the newsletter, you'll get access to exclusive content that we don't post on socials and a bunch of updates and exclusive discounts, that sort of thing. Uh, so we really encourage you to go and check that out. Okay, listeners comments. This old Warhammer says, what an excellent episode. It's always great when you let Paul out of the dungeon to come on the podcast. Mm. But why is it that Paul is early on when Joe is not? Has anyone seen them on a podcast at the same time? Inquiring minds do want to know and it makes you wonder. Well, I come I out the dungeon. Onto you. I think <laughs> they're onto you, Paul. I come out the dungeon. Someone's got to go back in there. Yeah. <laughs> someone's someone, got to keep the, someone has to be in the dungeon. All someone's times, got to keep yeah. feeding coal into the furnace. To yeah, keep, to keep this yeah. system going. So you know, weirdly, I mean, in all the years I've worked for Siege, I don't think I've ever seen Paul and Joe in the same room. We never, we never in the same room. Never in the same room. Yeah, yeah. I don't know. Yeah, maybe there's some. I don't know, some weird thing going on with them, like not being... Warp shenanigans. Yeah, not being allowed yeah, in the same space. Yeah, or we just work in different departments. Is it, yeah, that, that, possibly. I mean, it could be that, yeah. It could be, <laughs> <laughs> could be that, yeah. yeah. Uh, but, you know, it's true. You'll you'll never see us in the same... I think it's like, you know, if, you know, string theory and splitting the atoms and stuff like that. If we ever met and shook hands, I think the world would end or something. <laughs> Is that that? Is that what's that big? Is that that Hadron Collider thing? If Hadron you, Collider. If, you, if, you, if, you if two, we ran into each other really quickly, <laughs> we'll create a black hole. Black hole. Yeah, yeah. yeah. that's it. Yeah. Yeah. We'll, we'll just look. Or the stupid. Eye of Terror. It could be that. You could, could literally do. make yeah. the Eye of Terror. Yeah, it's possibly that. But yeah. well spotted. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Eagle-eyed viewers, there uh, noticing that we're not. In the, maybe uh, if James wasn't here one week, we could maybe. I'll get my coat. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Okay, uh, Steve Harbour says, no mention of cat litter for small rocks. And they said that on the basing episode. Mm. That's quite good, actually. As soon as I got home, I thought, cat litter? Why didn't we say cat litter? But I, I have used cat litter once. And I remember trying to glue it down. And obviously, like, the glue just kind of sort of soaks into soaks it. In. And it always, I always found that it all just, always just came off of the base. Did you use it well. as, like, full basing material or as, like, the occasional scattered rock? On your base, it's quite material. good for scattered rocks because mm. it's quite big and chunky, isn't it? It's really good for for putting into that uh, your custom mix sand. So you put yeah. use it as one of the things you put litter. into it. Bit of cat litter. However, I I have got, got a little big bit... nuggets though. No, Leave no, them out. no, not not the not the big ones. No, I, what I was going to say was that um, I had. <laughs>
Yeah, they're really good to put in the custom mix uh, sand that I was talking about in the hobby hack from last uh, week's episode. I have got a little bit of a story though, however. Like, um, from one of the chaps who used to be at the gaming club in St. Albans used to use cat litter um, for, for his basin. And I'll never forget that I think he accidentally bought like scented cat litter. <laughs> <laughs> so like, he's, like, whenever he opened his case, there would be like this, this like, ambience of like vanilla lemon, or lemon lemon citrus kind of like i suppose there's uh, worse things that cat litter could yeah. smell of so yeah i mean there is that but but, but I, I was always under the assumption that cat litter isn't it like supposed to absorb moisture and stuff like that so like will, yeah. so like you'll be forever putting like pva and stuff on it because it'll just keep absorbing it and things like that i don't know i don't I just, yeah. i've never Funny old thing. I can imagine using it for little scatter rocks and things like that, but actually just mm. caking it onto a base. I mean, the, the, I only know one person that's done it and it was a citrus, citrus <laughs> cat. But, uh, but, this but, planet uh, smells of vanilla. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> my, my trick for that is always to get the, the little slate chips that you use for like gardening and landscaping. Literally just get one mm. of those, put it in a Ziploc bag, smash it to bits of a hammer and you get these lovely little yeah. shards little of slate. slate. Mm. Or you can go on eBay and just buy the shards. It could do, yeah. Yeah, but, but if you do it yourself, you can get like different, because if, the more you crush it, the finer and smaller yeah, yeah. it gets. So you can have like nice large pieces yeah, or you can have smaller ones. And then like one of those garden slate chips, that was like a whole army. Yeah. So. It's pretty cool. Yeah. Yeah. Cat litter. Good. I I, I wouldn't personally use it, but yeah. But yeah. Cat litter. Contested. Cat litter. Yeah. <laughs> Controversial. Hot or not. Idea yeah. that, oh, that's right. I think you can use it or not. <clears throat> yeah. Potentially. Do it your way. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, ben Kebados says, in regards to painting and spending a lot of mental energy sharing it on social media, I started a secret army project with the premise that I'll only show it off when it's done and I won't even say what army it is. So I limit my need for external validation and train myself to trust the choices I make when it comes to painting. I'm telling everyone in our group because I hope some people will join in if they struggle with the same things. It's a weight off my shoulders I didn't realise I had, and it's absolutely reignited my passion for army painting. Yeah, that's mega. Mm. That's absolutely mega. I think that's that's touching upon the comment where I made about just feeling like I need to paint to post something on socials or whatever. I that's that's amazing. That's a great idea. Um and I think what you could even do in that is you could you could rather than post it on socials, you could arrange if you're doing it with friends or with like your local gaming club or people around or whatever, or even meetups like Warhammer World or, or your local shop or whatever you could stage kind of like certain dates that you all meet up and mm. bring and sh bring the models you painted in that period as well yeah that's quite that, cool. could, that could be quite yeah. cool yeah, yeah. I, I was mean, quite I, conscious of it after that conversation because I, I was finishing my blood angels right around the time that we recorded the last episode and there was still some touch-ups and stuff I wanted to do and I was like itching to share them and I was like no 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 chill take the photos take your time notice your touch-ups like do anything you want to do and then I haven't got to just like blast them all over it just for that validation. Like I've done them. I'm happy with them. That should be all the validation I need. Uh, I don't get me wrong. I like, I like obviously. It's nice to share. It obviously. is nice to share it obviously. Yeah. But it, it really, I think since that conversation, it's really made me conscious of, of, of that. And I've really thought about that a lot more. Like, you know, who am I actually doing this yeah. for? Like it's for like, my models that I painted for me and, and okay, fine. Yeah. Like, you know, because the things I've had, I've, uh, like, there's a model that I've posted a, an unpainted version of that I will get around to painting at some point in the not too distant millennium. But, <laughs> but like, um, but, um, but I get asked about updates if it's going yeah. it to mm. be, and it's like, that, that I was, it's like I said, you, that there's that pressure now to like, right. Okay. Well, it's out yeah, the bag. You, problem, know, I've got to, you know, so I think, I think it is better to just, yeah. Take to, pictures as you go along. Yeah. But don't necessarily post them. Yeah. Is that, because sometimes if you do post work in progress pictures, like you say, you then get a little, you, I, I think there's a, there's, a, there's a real difference, isn't there, from if you post something that's partially complete, then just sitting there and taking a few pictures as you're going along, completing the whole project, and then posting the pictures. Because mm. if you post it, like you've said already, during the process, yeah, I, if, I feel more obliged then, oh, I've got to finish this now because people want to see it. Yep. And perhaps, I don't know, maybe you don't take as much care as you would have done if you hadn't have posted the work in progress because you want it, you need to get it finished now. I think that can go both ways though because I think you can get in the habit of posting work in progress photos as a way of like making it feel like you don't have to do anything else. It's like I had this thing of, um, there was this like study and it said that you get as much uh, reward from telling your friends you're going to start going to the gym as if you'd have just gone. So I kind of see it in a similar way of like, if I just post a whip, I haven't got to bother finishing it because it's like you've kind of cashed in the reward 
already. Yeah, before, and there's yeah. no incentive to finish it because you've already had people leave comments and likes. Yeah, and stuff. yeah. Does that make sense? I, yeah. I, I really see it a lot now. It's like I always say, like keeping up with the Joneses. That's exactly exactly what it is. Like you, you see all the other this other stuff that's been put on socials, and you just feel obliged to add your throw your hat into the ring. If that makes mm, sense. Like, yeah. Um, and I'm actually, I, I think looking back now, because I've thought about this a lot over the last week or so, like since we had the conversation about it, but like I genuinely feel that like most of the stuff that I'm happiest with has been the stuff that I maybe haven't shown as much of or that are like during the process because then I've actually been focusing on the mm. process rather than I've got to get this done so I can then take a photo of it. Does that make sense? Yeah. Um, I think I've been very guilty of that in the past where I've been just trying to paint for, for that because you feel like you're not... You're not showing what you're doing when everybody else is. You go, you can't help it. You go on there and you see all this stuff that everyone else is posting all the time. And you, yeah. you just feel like, oh, I've got to. Frame. Also, I think there might be a bit of this kind of, what is it, FOMO, fear of missing out? Yeah, yeah. Kind of level of thing. Yeah. It's like if I don't post about it, is is it even happening? It's like if a tree falls yeah. in the woods, you know? Yeah. Or or the latest miniature that comes out, you know, people have, have got it and had it painted within, you know, a couple of weeks of it being out. You think, oh, I haven't done that. So you, well, I need to I need to produce things quicker to get more pictures online to get that little bit of a kudos. Yeah, 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 yeah. A bit of recognition or whatever. But I think as well, ultimately, I suppose if I mean, like you like you've sort of kind of addressed is who are you painting for anyway? Mm. You know, you paint it. You're doing it. It's a hobby that you're doing it. You know, you're doing it for yourself, mm. aren't you? Really. So, does it really matter what anyone else thinks? It's a difficult one. It's difficult. It's really difficult, especially when you're surrounded by social media all the time. Of course, and you're saying, yeah. you, you know, and yeah, it's it's, it's hard. It really I know it, is. there's this whole thing with artists. Okay, you, you know, you're doing, you are doing artwork, um, and having it critiqued by other people is part of that artistic process. Mm. So I, I mean, like when I used to do. I did a lot of artwork, kind of mm. portraits and things like that, and things, uh, and animal portraits and big things like that. And part of that process was, after I'd finished the portrait, was then getting it validated by other people. Yeah. Not necessarily me thinking, oh, that's, that's an awesome picture, or actually I could have done better there. Some, I, I, what I tend to think was, I wasn't too keen on a certain piece of artwork, but I know someone else will really love it. So even though I don't, feel that it's a very good piece i know that if i post that picture online there's going to be plenty of people out there that say oh, that's awesome that's really nice so that you, you still get that little bit of a the, the problem is though because so because of the way the social media works it's not actually real and the reason the reason i say that is because what gets likes and clicks and attention and validation isn't necessarily what's good or what's your no. best work and we see that all the time like especially with um running the siege accounts and posting all the incredible models that the team paint mm. but like objectively better, more well-painted models aren't necessarily the ones that are going to get more attention and more we, validation. We say this all the time. So like, you know, <clears throat> obviously that like, Space Marines are king. Like you post Space Marines and people love them. And, I, and, I, and there's nothing wrong with that. I love Marines. I think it, like everybody, everybody does. But but like we, we, we've we posted some, like honestly, some absolutely like amazing Eldar models, for example. We always, me and George always talk about this. Like mm. we get some incredible like Eldar projects that come in and like, Eldar models like Phoenix Lords. We've done custom like, custom characters before like or like there was a there, were, yeah. remember, there was a really good jet bike or talk with like this orange and purple scheme that we've done in the past like there's like there's these like fantastic miniatures which the team put hours and hours of hard work and effort into for our clients and it goes up on socials and it just doesn't get the attraction yeah. that a space marine will do yeah, you know right. and, and as much as as much as it's good the marines get that attention they are the poster boys you know they are the th the, the, the thing that a lot of people got into 40k before but it's just a shame because, like, at a granular level, like the the, the those other models are still painted like it, amazingly, and in in some cases even better than maybe or to a hot say better to a higher level, for example, yeah. than than maybe a, a squad of marines, for example. You know, and if you're relying on that validation from the social media, you set yourself up for disappointment because I've I've seen this in myself when I've got into bad habits. Some models that I've had a lot of emotional investment in, and mm. I spent a lot of time on, and I was really proud of, and I thought they were amazing. Have not done well on social media. Yeah, and Did because you, I've had stuff that was like, you know, maybe I had a post that did like take off and catch fire, or whatever. Even though it wasn't that well painted, that becomes your new benchmark of like, okay, I painted this marine that was like decent, and it got you know five thousand likes. Yeah, and then you post something that you you're like, oh, this is the one, and it gets like two thousand likes, and you're like, oh, 
that you, you bum yourself out. Yeah, you can but see that in your own artwork. The, 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 that's the really interesting thing then, because you look, you then you then associate the quality of what you've done with the amount of likes and stuff that it's got on yeah, there. Yeah, which is yeah, and it's not like, it's like that's it's got nothing to do with that. Like, no. it, it, like there's nothing nothing at all which correlates between the amount of time someone has double tapped or tapped on the screen and how good or refined your brush strokes are. Yeah. Do you know what I mean? So. I, it's a real And then when you do get like it's funny as well because like you 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 say oh I want to get like feedback and mm. then when someone says something critical yeah because you're That's used your to feeds. seeing all the good stuff it's almost like they're seen as like hating on you yeah. which yeah. isn't true either. Yeah. And so I think a lot of people say oh I want feedback what they actually mean is, I want you to say it's good. Yeah. Well, that, that's that's exactly why. Like for example, in critique clinic, that's the reason why we always say we go opinionated and factual. So then you've got stuff that's like, well, there's a mold line there, or you've not drawn the barrel, or you've done this, or whatever, blah blah. And then you've got, oh well, you've done the cape this color. We'd probably do this color, but there's nothing wrong with the color you painted. Yeah. So like, but I that's think, why we do critique clinic because it's like people are asking for feedback. We don't want to just sit there and look at photos and models and say this is great because that's not helpful to no, you. No, of course that it doesn't actually help you. Of course it isn't. No. That's not what you're asking for. If you're asking for feedback, are you asking for feedback on ways you can improve? Or you're asking for me to say, yeah, that's great. Well done. Yeah. There is a difference. I, I, in a, in a, sorry to segue around a little bit. And I know this will start from a, from a viewer or a listener's comment, but like, uh, I, I always think competition is exactly the same thing. Like with entering competitions, like I have always entered things that I love, like, mm. because I see the judging process at a competition, very similar to like social media. And, and the best way for me to explain that is, you have people, the three, the three, five, seven, 10, 15 judges or whatever that judge, they all have their own personal interests and biases that they like, obviously, of the miniatures. So ultimately then, who are you painting for? Are you painting for yourself to enter something or are you painting to cross a cross a, a line with people that are- Yeah. Are, are you entering are, to win a trophy yeah, or are you entering yeah. to get better at painting? Are you entering to get better at painting? And like, uh, I will always die on the hill of, I'll just paint stuff that I really love and enter it and- if something happens amazing and if it doesn't then then uh, that's not that's not the cherry on the cake for me the yeah. cherry on the cake is 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 like getting better getting better yeah. or doing something that truly is something that a i love and b i've painted to the best of my ability at that point yeah. in time if that makes sense and and i and i think that's that's very similar to social media like i, th I don't see it any different like you kind of you kind of got to see like your followership or the people on social is as kind of like that judging panel but like magnified massively mm. um and then you just got to re I, i've just realized that like i'm painting for me and yeah. like and if people like it mega if they don't or if they don't think it's my best thing or whatever that's cool you know like i i, I think that's i think that's i i've I, that since that comment last week I, it's really yeah. I thought i've thought about it a lot more and it's really shifted my my thought process on sort of like just socials in general like you know um, Do you know what flipped the switch for me on my instagram and how i got out of that like bad habit was I, in the captions section now, I treat it as like my own introspective on the model. So when I, when I complete a model now, it's almost like a reward for myself is when I sit and write that caption, I write like a decent sized amount of text, a few sentences. And I actually think about what went well with the model, what I did like, what I didn't like, and try to reflect on it. And then that's like, I, I do that for myself. And that's like the fun of posting. Like, it's nice to get all the comments and stuff after, don't get me wrong, but like, the, the main re I, I've thought about like maybe even starting a blog because of this because the the main thing I'm getting out of it when I finish it is I I tie a nice little neat little bow on it I sit and have I, I put you know pen to paper my thoughts down and like it's like nice concluding thoughts and then that way in a couple of months when I go back and look at a model I've probably forgotten in my head like what I enjoyed about it or what I didn't like about it or what I was thinking at the time and I've got a nice little snapshot of how I felt after that model yeah so in three years when I'm a better painter. You can go and back. I can look back and go, oh, at the time I actually was really struggling with well, this or I actually really yeah, loved yeah. it or I was yeah. really proud of that. That's exactly it. It's, it's like, I always say it's like a minute, finished miniature is a moment in time captured. It's like, and that's exactly what you're saying with the text. Like, you know, I think, I think one of the things that I like to do, similar to yourself, George, is, is I like to write in the, in the descriptions, like a document kind of like how I felt it's gone, how I, what I think I've done okay, what maybe I know I need to work on. I think that, because it, because really that's, that, I don't sound really see, but that caption isn't for the, isn't for the person the viewer, it's viewing you. it, it's for the person. Yeah. You've got to really so, think about how you yeah. write it as well because yeah. you don't want to write it in a sense of like you're trying to tick boxes and like yeah. for, for the reader, like you really have got to sit down with the mindset of I'm writing this caption for me to look back on in 18 mm. months. Yeah, yeah. I think that's, I think that's, it's really, that, the last week or so, it's really made me think about it a lot because I, I, I never thought about it that way. You like, you, you like keeping up with the Joneses kind of was the, was kind of like the, 
the I think the way that a lot of us inadvertently think of social media or use Do you social think media, that you know. The social media size of things can steer what you paint. I think so, yeah. Because obviously if you're like you said before, if 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 you notice, you know, that certain things on your social media profile aren't getting as much attention as other things, are you is is that gonna steer your next choices towards what you actually do? Sometimes you see something and, and you're like, Yeah, I, I really want to paint that. Like, Even you if know, you, it's not what you really want to do. No, but yeah. I'll do that because I know that's gonna get lots of attention. My yeah. my issue in that regard is I'm in a sort of quite a specific position where most of my painting time is doing stuff for Siege. We're doing commissions. And it's all for social media. <laughs> well, it's not that. It's that I haven't got the time to even think that far ahead because yeah. all of my painting time is, I, I don't get to choose the projects that I'm working on typically. Yeah. It'll be like a new release from GW or a client's commission. I've yeah. not chosen what's coming out. Mm. So I'm painting that, which I think is actually a good thing. It's kind That's of freed me yeah. up quite a lot because I've not had to fall into that. Well, I was, no. just, I was just about to say, but look at like, so obviously with, even with that all being said, all the stuff you've done recently, both like commissions and also like the stuff you've done for like stuff that you've been sent or whatever, blah, blah. Like, but then look at where you've then focused on one thing, best chapter obviously, but where, look, <laughs> at, where, look at where you fact, fact, focused mm. on one thing and then you produce something at the apex of your ability at that point in time and that you still get that reward, you still get that personal reward. But like, so it, that's what I'm saying. Like the, you, you appreciate that time a bit more that you've got to put into that thing, and you produce something that is the best you painted. And and I think that's, I think that's a good way to fluctuate between those two things. But in, in you know, t touching back upon the point, like I think one of the things with social media that I I really has come to the light of for me in the last couple of weeks or so is just that like because it's such a it's it's almost like another job like keeping that running yeah. and, I, and I've got to take my hat off to those that, that those that do the I mean we obviously run the siege account and you know do that but like it, it is I don't I don't want my personal social media for painting to feel like the work one if no, it's, it's very amazing. hard when your job is social media to not treat your own personal social media like a job yeah yeah yeah, yeah. yeah. it's it is hard it's, yeah. I suppose you've got to think of it as almost part of the hobby mm -hmm. After you finish the, the epic base, yeah, <laughs> take yeah. Uh, collate your work in progress pictures and and do a proper sort of like you say bow, bow tying, yeah, part of the hobby, which yeah. is it's, it, which is definitely part of the hobby now. Oh yeah, social media is definitely part of the hobby. Yeah. It is, yeah, hundred percent. Yeah, we frequently hear from you with questions asking how you can paint like our team of world class and award winning artists. Teaching is something that all of the team here at Siege are very passionate about. And we want to share with you the methods and techniques that we use to paint every single day, all of the incredible miniatures and armies that you have seen from us. With the Seed Studios Patreon, you'll gain access to a growing catalogue of over 300 step-by-step -step tutorials covering a huge variety of colour schemes, miniatures, painting styles and techniques, from beginner-focused foundation tutorials to full character masterclasses. Each lesson comes in a beautifully designed and easy-to-follow PDF format with accompanying artist commentary with new tutorials added every single week. Your subscription also includes access to our private patron channels on Discord so that you can interact directly with our artists asking for questions or feedback. You'll also be supporting the podcast directly, helping us to bring you these episodes every single week. So if you want to take your painting to the next level and make the most of your very valuable hobby time, head over to patreon.com forward slash siege studios. Okay, our main topic for this week, as you have guessed from the title of this episode, is going to be five things that are holding back your painting, things that you can stop doing and start doing uh, to see improvements pretty much straight away with your miniature painting. Um, this list is not a definitive list. It's just a few of the things that I've noticed I've commonly seen uh, when we're doing like the feedback and things like that uh, of the past few weeks. And it's just some commonalities that I noticed. Uh, and I think I've been guilty of pretty much all of these. And we had a little bit of discussion before this uh, episode as well. Uh, so something that we've all like seen um, kind of at all levels of painting, uh, all levels in a painting journey. I don't think it's specific to beginners. I don't think it's specific to being a more advanced painter. Um, the first one I've got is using washes, one, far too frequently, two, on too much of the model, and three, specifically on flat surfaces in particular. Um, what started this was when I was a beginner, it was very much a washes make everything look better. I should yeah. put them on everything, every surface of the model. It's almost yeah. like a dip wash. Yeah. And I think now because you've got the contrast paints and stuff being very, very popular, it's I'm almost been like uh, validated that you can do that. Yeah. And I think it's starting to go a bit too far the other way. And I think with contrast paints and washes, tactical use of them, mm. I think there are, there are less is more tool 
Yeah. Um, Paul, when you was on your first episode with us, I think you spoke about how you've like ditched contrast paints, um, which in my head are like I, I do see as I'm putting them in the same umbrella camp as a wash, um, just by the way you apply. Them. Yeah, you can't just in terms of the all over slap it one yeah. approach. I know people use contrast paints differently, washes differently, yeah. but I'm talking about you know yeah, yeah. putting it all over the model. No, they're definitely a, a great tool to get you started in the hobby, um, and it was I, I found them really useful for getting back into the hobby. You know, just like I think we said this all before, you know, picking up the brush again and getting that sort of muscle memory back. Um, and obviously, you, you know, you, you tend to use the way that you're the way that you're shown by GW, which is kind of really sort of flooding the area and kind of letting it dry and things like that. Um, they're great for highly detailed models, not so much on big flat panels and things like that. Um, but yeah, I, um, I t- <laughs> a bit more tactically now, I use them a bit. I don't use them as much anymore. Hardly ever, in fact. Um, I've moved up away from them quite a lot, but when I it, but when I <laughs> but when I do use them, uh, it's a it's a far. I use them kind of as glazes now and things like that. And, and with the dipping like washes and things like that, I'm much more. I've got. I've, I'm much better at controlling the paint on my model now, which I think that it's it's good for washes because you could, like you said before, you can just wash the whole area, and it can look. <laughs> Yeah. It can look terrible. Well, I guess it? I guess one of the things I didn't really explain too much there was like the issues that come from doing that. Yeah. One of them being because washers are quite uncontrollable, they tend to pull in areas that you don't want, particularly while they're drying. That's when you see like tide, marks, get tide and things. marks and things. Well, yeah. The reason I said flat surfaces in particular is, for example, if you took a Space Marine Rhino, that's literally a flat box on all four sides, yeah. and you put a wash over it, all you're doing is tinting the surface, making it look dirtier, and adding a bunch of staining. Yeah. It's much less control. If you're looking to shade a model. There are much more tactical ways to go about doing that. Yeah. that give you better results, and they're not necessarily harder. No, uh, even even if you just water down your washes, I, I started doing that. You know, I, I just use the wash straight from the pot because you know and that's what you know. Get your ag rat, ag, ag rats, and just chuck it on there. Job done. But but now with it, I'm looking for a bit more refinement and a little bit more control. So I'll start doing my shading or, or using the wash, but I'll, I'll water it down. Yeah, and almost using turn into even like a really watery glaze, even if that's like just brown. Oh, I know it's brown water anyway, but well, that's one of my favourite ways to use the washers. Even with we were talking yeah, about the June Steeler models earlier. Up. Yeah, on my June Steeler mm. uh, Colts models that I've started, uh, that I did actually do for the first time in a while a wash over the head, but it was a thinned thinned down yeah. mix with water. I think that. People think as well. I've heard a lot of people say like, "Oh, you can't use washes with wet palettes and things." That's nonsense. That's, yeah, yeah, no, I, I do. Yeah. I'll, I'll plop it on the on the wet palette and just uh, I mix it uh, maybe with like you know one brush full of wash with three or four brushes of water. Yeah. Just really yeah. water it down. It's much easier to like creep up on the it finish is, you're yeah, going yeah. for. If you if it takes you three or four passes with a wash, yeah, at least you can get to that level of depth and saturation that you're looking for gradually rather than put yeah. the wash on and go oh it's way too dark yeah, yeah. I've not, and because with washes it's much much harder to tidy up because you've got that tint and the area where the wash is pulled when you go back in with the base coat mix there's like a harsh line but yeah there can be yeah yeah you're definitely right i think my contribution to this is is going to be something that i think was quite groundbreaking for me many many moons ago uh, um and when I, when I was speaking to someone at one of the conventions we were at. Um, so I bumped into a few of the, the heavy metal team at Salute once and I'll never forget, it was, um, I always painted dark to light, always painted dark to light. And it, it was like someone turned on the biggest light bulb ever. So I remember the moment I, was, I said, I was at Salute, I think it's 2014, 2015, I think it's when I bumped into a couple of the guys from heavy metal we were at Salute. I was talking to them and they were just talking about like painting in general. And, and one of them turned around to me and said, well, like, do you, do you why don't you start light? And I went, hmm. And it, it literally, I was like, why did I not think of that? Like, washes, obviously, you apply to a, to a surface to dull down. And essentially, you're trying to put shadow where it needs to be. Yeah. And I think, like, with that, like, when we when a lot of people who get into the hobby start, they start and they follow, they, they watch the GW videos. And, they, and again, I just want to caveat and say, there's nothing wrong with that way of painting. It gets you to a really good finish for, for gaming for but if you really want to push your painting and start adding more refinement and control to miniatures it's not just that it's the like i said it's not always the quickest and easiest way because washes are seen as this like umbrella tool for shading yeah yeah a wash isn't always the fastest quickest and easiest well, well, way it, to shade a model this is exactly what i was going to say like like at that point where they're like well, why don't you start light and i was like 
it's, it's way easier to put shadow on a lighter object and just place it where you need it rather than paint the whole thing dark and then layer it out. I was like, why the hell do I not think of that? So like, is it like, bizarre? It, like, it, it, it just, you, yes, you do need to be more controlled and more refined by placing shadow where it needs to be. So like a typical example, if you've got a marine shoulder pad and, you're, and like you want to add the, the shadow in the recess around the trim, you know, like there's no way you'd wash the whole pad. Like I know people mm. do do that. I know there's lots of tutorials out there that show you to do that, et cetera. But if you just want to get shadow in that recess around the pad, just, just paint the recess dark. Just literally just take your time and be neat and just paint that recess dark with that color. Yeah. You can still use the wash. It's a bit more viscous, a bit more watery. It, it, it moves on the surface a bit better than, than maybe a thicker paint or whatever, blah, blah. But, but like, I, I think that's one of the biggest things I would always say to someone if they're wanting to improve their painting. Start light. Don't start dark. It's the best thing that anyone was ever, anyone ever told me. And it's the, one of the best things I ever learned m many years ago was literally just to just to flip it the other way around. So when you say let's start light, what do you mean? Does paint it, paint the miniature so like, lighter than you. So, like, instead well, of a mid tone. So, so yeah, paint the minute paint your model lighter than it needs to be. Yeah. If you want, or not lighter than it needs to be. Just paint your model lighter. Okay. Yeah. So I always the way I explain it is before your highlight stages, so your edge highlight stages, mm. but brighter than your mid tone, so that you start with the lightest color before you start doing your highlighting. Right. Because then you can add shadow to it incrementally. Yeah. You can pin shade it. You can glaze on there to tone like the bottom of the pad slightly dark if you want shadow at the bottom, if you want that kind of look or whatever. For, for example, just to help James yeah. out, say you had... Help me out. <laughs> no, it's fine. It's okay. <laughs> I, say, I, say, you had, say you had a red cloth yeah. and you wanted it to be nice, bright, vibrant red, but with some nice dark shadows and some brighter, say, orange highlights. Yeah. Rather than starting with a dark red as a base coat and then adding progressively brighter red highlights and working mm. your way up, yeah. James is saying start with a nice bright red. Yeah. Then in the shadows, start glazing in and adding your blends into the shade. Yeah. And then add your highlights on top. Right. Because the thing, is, the thing is, is like what you've got to understand as well is that like by starting lighter, you're putting on that first layer of paint, whether you airbrush it or whether you rattle can it or whether you put a really smooth thin layer with a brush and build it up to a solid opacity. You're starting with a, a closer point to the brightest point of that object, which means you mm. actually have to put less paint on the object to get it bright. Does that make sense? Yeah. The because the light paint because typically covers worse. It's yeah, much, yeah. much fa like faster and easier to put. For example, if you took the extremes, if you was to paint white over black, yeah, it doesn't cover well. It would take a lot of coats. If yeah. you used to put black over white, you can probably do it in one. Yeah, yeah, yeah it, it is. It is easier to paint a darker color over a lighter object, and the virtue that it gives you is that you can incrementally add thin, refined layers of that dark to subtly add the shadow on. Does that make sense? Yes. Yeah. No. Yeah. I, and and that's, that's, my mind is kind of blown. <laughs> like, that's, that's exactly at my, like, all those years ago at Salute. I was literally like, yeah. I, I, I said, I, I, I didn't I bumped, think of that earlier. It was, I bumped into Paul Norton, I bumped into Aiden there, but we we're both talking and like, and, and then it, like Aiden turned around to me and went, well, why don't you start light? And I was like, why the hell did I well, think of that? Yeah. Makes like, perfect sense. And I, it literally, I was like, I was dumbfounded. I was like, oh my God, why have I been painting that way for so long? Like, mm. because the thing is, I was looking at like, in metallics are a great example. So like, I've, I've got an old Dante model that I started dark, right? Okay. And yeah. it took forever to layer up to the brightest golds on that mm -hmm. armor. I painted the, the next one after that. I painted it. I painted it. Silver. No, <laughs> <laughs> they go that crazy. Paul. Like, yeah. I painted it like a bright, an airbrush, yeah, like yeah. a really vibrant, vibrant gold, bright, bright gold on. Then I started adding Working all the subtle, backwards. subtle shading into like the, the abstracture and like all the, the side, uh, the, the, I think they're called lats. I'm not a gym, gym girl, obviously, but, but Muscles. like all those, all those, all those muscular structure on the, on his armor. I was like, I was like, and the difference between the two, I was like, I felt like I'd unlocked like some magical power. Cause I was like, I was like, I was like holy crap. Like that's like, that's like the difference was yeah. night and day to use a pun. But and like, you're adding, let, you're, you're putting less paint on the model overall because you can do that shade in like one go. Yeah. It's less, less chance for mistake because you haven't got to do it in six passes. You can do it in two. For yeah. Yeah. Like it just, it like, it totally changes the way you paint. And I think one of the virtues of it as well is that it, teaches you to be way more refined with the brush because you're more focused on placing the shadow incrementally in those little details and yeah. recesses rather than i've made it all dark i've now got to layer up all again you yeah know? and and like again i just want to say like the, the the way of painting when you start dark and where there are you know places that teach obviously to start dark and stuff that, that that's there's nothing wrong with that like it'll get you to a certain point as a painter but i think that the moment you switch to starting lighter and adding shadow rather than adding dark and adding light, hmm. I think it totally transforms your painting. I'll have to give that a go next next time. Yeah. Next one I do. Yeah, do it. After Agrax. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs>
Okay, next one on the list. This actually ties in nicely with what we're saying about having to do less paint layers. One of the most common things I see is when people are having issues with texture on a model, and one thing we often hear is, how do you get that so smooth? How do you get that so smooth? A lot of the mistakes happen. It's not, uh, people put it down as like, oh, you haven't thinned your paint enough and things like that. I see this time after time after time with watching beginner's paint is when you're brushing the paint on the model, people keep going back over and over and over and reworking, agitating that paint. And because they're acrylic paints and we're thinning them down with a lot of water, those paints start drying in seconds. Like the, from the second you pick it up off of your wet palette, your thinned paint off of your wet palette onto your brush, <laughs> yeah. it's already drying. Yeah. Once you brush it onto your model, you've got very, very short working time. And this is something that I struggled with for a long, long time, especially when I was making mistakes and things actually I've spoken on a previous episode. You need to let that paint dry before you go over it again. So say you're base coating a Space Marine, for example, you're base coating all the armor, let's say blue. Say you've primed it black and you're not an airbrush user. Say you've primed it all black and you want to base coat with the blue. If you want to do nice thin layers and get a smooth finish, once that once you've done that brush stroke on that panel, you need to stop working the paint. Even if you've not done full coverage or you realize, oh, there's a little streak that I've missed, let it dry before you go back over it. Because even, and let it dry thoroughly, because even when it like starts to look dry, you know, it starts to go like not quite matte, but it's just starting to get there. And you can obviously see when the paint's still wet. Yeah. Once it starts drying, that's when you're going to start lifting bits of drying paint. You're going to get these like tiny little, like almost like paint crumbs. Like these tiny, when you look at a, a model that's been done in this way, you'll see that there's lots of little flecks and little spots of like almost looks like sand or like grit. And that's where the paint that's been drying has been brushed over again. And some of it is lifted and it's created texture on the model. Yeah, well, I want to add on to that as well, because the thing is, is that there's a lot of things with painting that because you don't visibly see it, you don't inherently, because you're concentrating and focusing your attention on the painting in the miniature, the way you're actually doing it, you don't focus or concentrate on the executions that makes sense yeah like, oh, i'm no, just gonna paint this yeah. pouch and you're yeah, focused yeah. on the pouch and putting the paint and blocking the pouch but you're not focused on this becomes the muscle memory of using the brush is actually a little bit detrimental like obviously you want to get good at using the brush and the pressure management the control of the brush etc but but the, that that muscle memory you develop sometimes can be a little bit of of an achilles heel and what the reason why i say that is one thing that is very common whether it, whether it's synthetics or whether it's whether it's uh, Kalinsky, like friction happens on the surface of that miniature whether you whether you realize it or not and i think being conscious that you're creating friction on the surface of the model means that uh, i mean this sincerely the smoother more controlled your brush strokes are on the surface of that miniature the smoother the result will be mm. and i'd argue like softer as well like you, yeah. you don't need to be attacking the model and doing like, like firm pressure, strokes. Yeah. You want to be just just yeah. nice, smooth, delicate mm. touches with the brush. Yeah, I'm guilty of that. That, that, whacking that it <laughs> as, a, as a little thing, that completely, completely, like once that was, once I learned that as in like through just trying different things and like, oh, I've been playing with pressure management for ages with brushes and stuff. But like, but like once I really locked that in, that created a huge change in the quality of my miniatures. Because like the thing is, is you're not, creating the things that george has said where you're lifting previous layers of paint that haven't yeah. fully cured or fully dried um you know and, and also as well like you, you don't think of the friction which is something that unfortunately you need to be conscious of as well as oh i'm trying to block in this pouch or paint this shoulder pad or block this aquila in or whatever you need to be conscious of actually how heavy you're being with a brush it makes a yeah. huge difference to the surface does that the also apply to like if you apply in really thin layers of paint mm. And you do, and you let it dry, um, and then you're going back with the next layer. If you're putting too much pressure on it, can the obviously the the new paint that you're trying to apply can that kind of reactivate the paint underneath and move that around? Or? If it's fully dried, I don't think so. Yeah. It's not so much that, but it's the okay. This is eighty percent dry. I'm going to start coat number two. Yeah, that's where you start to run into issues. It, it varies. I mean, some look. There are some paints that do reactivate. There are some paints that, for example, have more of a satin finish. And sometimes I've found that paints that have a bit more of a satin finish, if you put a layer over the top, they can, they can, they can react. They not reactivate. Like you can. The, but the you should be brushing brush. in such a way that that's not going to happen yeah. anyway, because you shouldn't be brushing hard enough for that to even be an issue. No. Yeah, so even right. if you had a paint that was likely to reactivate, you shouldn't be brushing it in such a way that you're attacking the model and reactivating yeah. that paint. And I just got to throw something else into the mix on this specific point as well. It's like your dilution of paint is just as important as how soft you use the brush. And what I mean by that is 
if I can get the paint to a consistency that is solid in opacity and it's viscous or watery enough that it maintains its opacity when I do a stroke, yeah. what you want is a perfect equilibrium or perfect balance of, of paint at an opacity which with a viscosity that when you do a pull stroke, one single pull stroke, it does a complete solid pass. Yeah. Yeah. Because what that gives you the confidence is if you, that rather than having to do five, six, seven, eight, nine passes to block that color in, yeah, because of how you dilute the, the dilution you've got on the paint, you can do one pull stroke and it will give that perfect layer one yeah. stroke. Does that make sense? Yeah, yeah. Yeah. So it's a fine balance between those two things. It's mitigating pressure, mitigating friction, whilst also getting the paint to an opacity and viscosity that allows you to do the pull stroke and get the solid color in one go. Yeah. And that, that, that helps massively. I get a bit more of the old sprue out and practice. On yeah. It. Yeah. Like, sprue is a perfect place to practice. Yeah. Like it's brilliant. Or just bases before you put your material on them. Yeah. 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 Card. yeah. I've got a big, I've got a flyer base that I literally with some a thousand grit sandpaper. I just put the base on that. So I've got, cause you know, it comes with that little kind of not texture, but it's got that it's kind texture. of, yeah. I yeah. Know, it is a little bit of texture perhaps. Then you get that and I just sanded that texture off so it's perfectly smooth. And then I just use that whenever I'm testing a new paint, whenever I'm trying to just, if I get a new paint and I want to learn the consistency, whatever, I just use that big base as a little test palette to just get, to get, to make sure I get the consistency to solid opacity, yeah. good viscosity. Uh, so you I know, the way I test paints, How? I just whack them straight on the model. <laughs> so this is, where, this is where, you know, learning all these different things. It's like it's something as just as simple as, I'll get a piece of plastic card or an old base or something just to even test well. it before you use it. Even as well, you'll see a lot of painters um, use like the side of their hand as a palette. I'm a, I'm a glove wearer when I paint because I don't want to yeah. get oils and stuff on the model. And I also don't want to get loads of paint on my hands. But before, pretty much with every single, every single time I load the brush, 99 times out of 100, before I put it on the model, I will quickly just brush it across this part of my hand yeah. just to one, check that I haven't, not realized I've over thinned the paint or that there's a, maybe there was a bead of water that was on the brush handle yeah, yeah. that like collected on the bristles when I was moving my yeah. hand that I didn't notice. <laughs> yeah. Checking things like that just before I put it on the model. And as well, I'm removing the excess moisture. So I don't like have a uh, too much, I haven't overloaded the brush. I can get a nice amount of paint on it on yeah. the wet palette, quickly brush it off my thumb. I, I'm looking at, you know, how the paint has been applied on there. Cause I'm wearing, I, I wear black gloves. So they cover quite yeah. like what James said with the base. So before I paint on the model, you know, I've, I've loaded up my brush, quick swipe on my thumb, and then I'll go. Yeah. Because the amount of times that I've caught, I've done something on there, and I've gone, oh, yeah, that was, I'm, that I'm was close. Like, <laughs> I mean, more recently, I suppose this year, I mean, I have, before I paint things, I, I just paint a little bit, do a little brush stroke on, on my thumb. Mm. Not necessarily to check consistency or anything, because that's not in my mind yet, but just to make sure I haven't got way too much paint on my brush so that when I plonk it on there, I don't get a big fat line or yeah. a blob yeah. or something, just to get some of the paint off. But but um, yeah, I should definitely um, test. <laughs> test definitely. I, and just, just to butt onto that and like hopefully just round that out for everybody. Like I think with mitigating friction everywhere on a minute on in your process, it's not just on the miniature. Mm. So just to go into a bit more context on that, you should mitigate uh, friction everywhere you paint. That's on the miniature, as we've already explained. That's when you're taking paint off the wet palette. Are you but, talking about sort of lightness of touch? Correct, yes. Yeah, lightness okay. of touch and control of pressure of the brush. You should mitigate friction on the, on the surface of the models I mentioned already. You should do it on the wet palette yeah. because that's, that's, that, that is, uh, well, it doesn't necessarily lend itself just to a wet palette, but on a wet palette specifically because it is paper, Yeah. Uh, whether it's baking sheet or the paper that comes with a, uh, with a palette or whatever. You, if you're too aggressive on the surface, you're going to pick up fibers because paper is made from fiber, okay? Um, that also translates to where you wipe the brush and dry the brush or yeah. re, uh, repoint the brush. If you do it on a paper towel, your, your friction on there. Um, the, in my personal opinion, the, the, the thing you should approach to, to really mitigate it is be conscious of that everywhere that you paint and also just supplement a couple of things. Like for example, the, 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 the base or the, the, on the back of the rubber glove, uh, or, or, and also like where you wipe the brush off, maybe replace, use a bit of paper for drying the brush, maybe at the end yeah. of the process. And just have like have like a uh, a damp damp bit of sponge or foam or something to just repoint and clean the brush, for example, because you're less likely to pick up loads of of fibers which are going to go into the paint through doing that rather than obviously paper towel. So paper again, towel. in general, like yeah. mitigating friction yeah. in your painting process will completely improve the quality of your painting and also just give you something that you're more proud of. And quickly to tack onto the end of that, in the spirit of like contaminants and things, I said this a few episodes ago. Wherever you store your models, 
like there's pretty much no way to get around dust because they're so small. Before you start painting, have a big, like cheap makeup brush that a lot of people buy them for dry brushing. Have like a, a br- not one with paint on it, obviously. Clean one. Don't ever contaminate it with paint. That's the <laughs> point. Brand new one, fresh yeah. one that's never been used for paint before. Quickly just brush off the model. And if you're a dry palette user, before you start painting, make sure your palette hasn't got anything on it. If you're a wet palette user, make sure you're keeping the lid on to stop yeah. dust from getting in there and also, sealing it. A little t- little tip as well, you know, you get the little squeezy bottles. Mm-hmm. Make sure the tops of those have got no dry paint on them. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Because yeah. so, you know, obviously, when that when you squeeze that out, you get little, you get these little tiny flecks of old dry paint in there. Yeah. yeah That's yeah, where the so glass comes in. Because, like I said, the amount of times that I'll, I'll brush it onto my thumb, I also see like a little bit of dry paint. Yeah. Come from like a dropper yeah. bottle lid. Yeah. No, yeah. that's good. I'll, I'll try and bear these. All oh, is I've got too many tips going into my head at the minute. If you enjoy listening to these podcast episodes every single week, I'd like to ask that you could please do us one small, tiny favor in return and hit that subscribe button on YouTube or the follow button on your podcast app. It takes only two seconds and it really, really helps us out and it allows us to bring you these episodes for free every single week. Thank you so much. Back to the episode. Okay, well, let's get to the next one, uh, which is something which we've spoken about many, many times on the show, but we'd like to collate it into one little Segment, segment, yeah, <laughs> is uh, rushing your paint jobs mm. and somehow expecting to improve. They're yeah. two fighting battles. There is an obsession in this hobby with speed, mm. which I've said many, many times I don't understand, but that's besides the point. Regardless of that, if you want to improve, take the time. And whether that's taking you know 20 extra seconds or 20 extra mm. minutes or 20 extra days, however you go about that, just being more conscious of the time you're spending on the model and I also find the, it's like I say, no one does their best work at like two o'clock in the morning, like prepping for the meeting. Do you know what I mean? It's like doing Depends your Depends what you're doing, doesn't it? I suppose. <laughs> but like whenever I've been in a rush for a deadline or something yeah. and like you're overworking, it, like you're in that manic rush, nothing good ever gets done. No, true. Take your time, spend yeah. the extra time, think about what you're doing. Just that mindset shift is often enough to just start seeing improvements. Yeah. yeah. I, I am... Uh, I, I do this a lot. I, I think I start off a project with good intentions and I, I thought, I always say, it doesn't matter how long I take on this, you know, not in any rush, but then, but then I end up getting quicker and quicker and quicker. And towards when I can see the finish line, you start rushing and then yeah. I start to rush all the little bits, like the, 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 the base that I don't really give too many thoughts about, like we spoke about last time, which I, I I'm starting to give more thought about these days, but, uh, and other things like, like the, the little bits that are on the model, okay, like the, you know, there might be a grenade or um, a little pouch somewhere or a, a purity seal or a buckle or a thing. I'll start to rush those little tiny bits mm. to get the thing finished. Yeah. Just so I've got it and I can say, yeah, I finished it. But then I always go back to it and think, oh, I wish I'd have spent, like you said, you know, a couple of extra minutes just doing those buckles properly or, or taking a bit more time because I notice them. Other people may not, but I, I notice these and things. And you don't notice the mistakes as well. Like if you don't stop to take a breath, like it's because yeah. you're in that rush and you're just like, right, okay, go get the patch done. Okay, quickly, now I've got to get the patch. Like you don't realize that you've made mistakes. It's I, not until you take a minute do, yeah. and come back and look at the model, which was my point what I was making about like staying up yeah. late is like the amount of times I've been painting because say there's a deadline coming up and I'm painting late into the night and I'm like painting as fast as I can. Then the next morning I look at the model and I'm like, what the hell is this? Yeah. Because in the moment I was like, okay, yeah, I'm making good progress. Like progress for the sake of progress isn't always not if you have to go back and correct exactly things which i end up having to do i I always have a tidy up phase yeah and i always end up going around and tidying everything up again after i've and do you wonder that if you'd just spent that time in the first place if it would have been quicker and yeah maybe yeah of course obviously but uh i I always do this i think well i I always factor in a tidy up phase into my painting process and everything because i think because i'm i think if i allow myself to to have that tidy up because i'm quite a new i'm quite new to it all I'm not dis- I'm not too disappointed that I've you know spent eight hours doing a you know armor, and then I've got I'm trying to do the rivets and I've got a little blob of paint somewhere and I think oh, I need to correct I don't get too beaten up about it I know I've got this little tidy up phase and I'll end up just tidying up little things yeah which is another leads brilliantly on to another little thing that I never do that I sh- really should start doing because it it does hinder things and that's making a note of what I'm. I'm doing as I go along because because when I need to correct a, a mistake because I'm speeding up for some weird reason I think what color did I use on that one I can't remember the what what ratio did I use for this and then I end up 
trying to correct a mistake and then that doesn't look right either. <laughs> yeah. So uh, it's all this process of rushing through things at the end just to have something that's finished yeah, and I, move on to the next project or whatever. I, I completely agree with those points, specifically, obviously, the notation and stuff. I always go on about painting in journal and writing down stuff and, and that's something that I recommend you, you should do um, as a painter. But um, I... I I like to flip this on the head a little bit. Like so you're quite right. There is a focus on speed in the industry and, and like with, with painting miniatures. And, and I always say this is a bit of a joke, but there is no Amazon of miniature painting. Like we are siege as a business is the closest thing to Amazon, but we're not next day. You know, that, like we literally will do it for you. You'll get it delivered to your house, but it's not gonna be next day. Like, and, and if you want it done good, it's not going to be done fast. Exactly. Yeah. Like I, I think that the focus in my mind and this, the, the, the way that I've tried to approach the, th the mindset behind it is focus on neatness, sharpness, smoothness, efficiency, and refinement. Like, I think they're the things that if you focus on those things, speed will come. Like I always say this, that re repetition is the mother of success. The more times you do something, the quicker you'll get at it. But most importantly, the more knowledgeable and, and muscle memory you will be at doing it. So if you're if you're focused on getting it perfect, the first time you do it perfect will never ever 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 be the quickest ever. But the more times you do that thing to perfection in your eyes and get it as neat, sharp, smooth, clean, refined as possible, when if if you painted, imagine painting the in I always say shoulder pad, but imagine painting the recessed line on that shoulder pad. You've got ten shoulder pads. The first one you do is never going to be your neatest. Yeah, the fifth, sixth one will be considerably neater. And the, the tenth one will be the neatest that you do. But each one of those to do will be quicker because your hand-eye coordination, your muscle memory gets better at doing that shape and doing those pull strokes or doing those strokes that are on the surface of the miniature. So I would flip, like, like the light dart thing earlier in the episode, I'd flip the mindset to I'm going to focus on neat, sharp, smooth, clean, refined, and speed will come. Yeah, yeah? because if you focus on those things, it, like the cleanup stage, I know you mentioned it. Like I used to do that a long time ago, and, yeah. and the thing is, like, oh. and every time I did it, I think to myself, why don't I just do it neat? Why don't I just paint it neat the first time I did it? Because then I wouldn't have to spend all the time doing it. And because time isn't finite, um, uh, sorry, because time is finite, and once you spent it, you don't get it back. That time that you're doing the cleanup, you could be painting something else. Yeah. So, so like I, I would advise and advocate flipping flipping your thought process when it comes to painting. If you want to get to be quick. Be quick at being neat, sharp, smooth, refined. Yeah. That's, well, it's that's drawing the line in the sand between being efficient and being quick. Like that, because we're we're obsessed with like efficiency and like you know working out the the most effective ways to do things. Because like you could be quicker overall, but it doesn't mean that you're rushing because you're working out where you're wasting time and trying to spend it more efficiently. For example, like with the cleanup stage, it's like. Say base coating this thing messily takes 30 seconds yeah. and base coating it cleanly takes 50 seconds, but you're spending 30 seconds of cleanup. It's like you're still 10 seconds net better off. It's That's, like trying to find yeah, yeah. where you can min max the efficiency mm. is not the same as rushing. So you could be quicker overall because you've been more efficient and you've been more process driven, but you're not in a rush when you're painting. No. So I say, I just need more practice. It, it, it is. I always say repetition is the yeah. number of success. It's a saying that I always say when we teach classes, but it, like it, it really is like, you know, your, your first time is never going to be your best, you know, no. like, but the more times you do it, the quicker you'll get and the better you'll get. And that's yeah. just, that's just factual in life about anything. You go to the gym, you don't go in, you don't, Walk in and pick up. Do the, one sit up. Six come out like oh, yeah, I know, salt pepper. Do you? You don't go in and pick up the sixty kg dumbbells and go. Yeah, I'll, I'll curl both of these. You know, it. like it doesn't you pick That's up the me, fives? <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I wouldn't be walking out of there. Like you know, um, like you, you, you know, lifting this up. Yeah, like you know. So it's 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 every it's, it applies to everything in life. But the, the the fact that we don't think about that when it comes to painting it baffles me because it's like it's exactly the same. There's no mm. difference at all whatsoever. So. Okay, number four on the list is stop defaulting to the same recipes for different materials. Classic example being, ah, I need to paint some leather on this model. Mm. Time to whip out the Rhinox hide. The default leather paint that I it, use for it's, everything. It's what I know. It's what I'm comfortable <laughs> with. <laughs> yeah. The reason I say this is a bad thing is because, one, you don't experiment. And often it's with experimentation that you find new, better ways of doing things. You default into your comfort zone and, you know, you don't realize because paints behave in different ways, you could be perhaps benefiting your brush skill by looking at it in a different way and you're not achieving different textures on different models and everything's going to kind of have this 
you know, it's different with an army, obviously, but if you're going from project to project and you notice the commonality of the like, I've noticed yeah. that, you know, these ragtag soldiers who are in the desert have rhinox hide belts, but so do these factory fresh space marines and so does yeah. it leather as an example, but I picked that because it's a natural material, has a massive variety of tones. But you kind of just default to this comfort zone, like regimented way of painting things. Do you know why that is? Because because I never write anything down, I know that I can my <laughs> I know that my recipe for for leather is this set baked thing. in. Yeah. It's baked in. But if that's that's a muscle memory of yeah, paint sure. usage. That's what it is. Yeah. Like I I I I'm glad you use leather because I just want to use this as an example. Like leather is skin. It's flesh. That's what it is. Mm. All right. Okay. Um. Everyone doesn't have the same skin tone. So why would you paint? Especially cows. Yeah, exactly. So why, why would you? Space cows. Space cows. Yeah. So why would you have, why would you have um, all of your leather exactly the same? Yeah. Like, and, and to touch upon it, like there, I think there's a layer of also realism on the miniature as well. So you're quite right. Exactly what you said. An organization or a, a military unit that are all like getting the best equipment or this kind of stuff would potentially have all the same equipment as in like their, all their, their webbing and stuff would all be the same. Whereas if you've got a militia unit that's <laughs> picking stuff up off of fallen enemies or they're like exactly. they're raiding, yeah. things, they would all have a myriad of different different things and different gear. So it's not just using those paints doesn't just convey a material, but it also conveys the feel of the unit as well. Does that make sense? Well, that's one of those subtle <laughs> so, things that you don't notice or like it's hard to realize when critiquing yourself is like, for example, say you was painting like a war band of you know, ragtag soldiers who like scrounge all this different gear and stuff. When you're looking at those, you don't necessarily realize that they all have the same leather. But when they do have that variation from each other, it's one of those things that you pick out and you go, oh, those miniatures look like really unique and cool. It's one thing that you don't notice, but like subconsciously makes your models look better. Yeah. Yeah. That's, that's exactly it. I mean, one of the best things to explain, I think, mean, just explain it is like it, thinking like in the pirate age, you know, a pirate ship would all have the, the, the clothing and equipment and all that stuff would be completely True, yeah. different. And then, like, if you, you know, it's, it's always always funny in like those old pirate films, like where they they put on like the Napoleonic like soldier uniforms to yeah. blend in, so then they can raid another ship. Do you know what I mean? So like, it's it's really like understanding that paint directly tells a story, not only in the material that you're rendering on the surface of the object, but also the story and feel of the unit. And I think that's really important. And breaking those muscle memory choices. Like I know a lot of people that do follow recipes very linear, and that's that's all well and good if you want to get the desired result that you're yeah. trying to copy. It's like it's like making a cake. Like for example, you'll follow a, a Gordon Ramsay recipe on how to make a cake or whatever. Um, and but Whoa, but in your, in, in your way in your way in your way of doing it, you might not even get the same result because no. there's natural instinctive muscle memory things that he will do in the process of making that cake. That makes sense. A lot, and he? shouts a lot, yeah. Shouts at the eggs yeah. and stuff. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. Don't shout at your paint, all right, okay? <laughs> Why are you not mad? Makes, yeah. like, yeah. makes his paint so, into a sandwich. Yeah, yeah. So, um, so yeah. But, um, but, but what I was trying to get at is, is that like, I think it's really important that like you do experiment because it creates these really amazing moments in miniature painting where you discover paints and, and th materials and, and, and tools and all these different things. Experimenting that allows you to find stuff that completely can change the way that you paint or completely yeah. gives you a finished result that you then fall in love with. And then you go, that that spurs a new strain of, oh, I'm going to do a whole unit with that because that does that. Do you see what I mean? So like, I think it's really important, like being linear and following recipes is all well and good. You might, just because you follow a recipe, you might not get the exact same execution because part of that is still inherently you as a painter or yeah. you as a person creating in a creative outlet. Um, but the experimenting... The gloves are off, and you can kind of just in, like you can make some fantastic discoveries while experimenting. And I always advocate, you know, doing that, picking up a new paint, you know, picking up a new thing. I'd rather, even though we're all guilty of having massive piles of grey shame, maybe not you, George, as, as much, but but like, I th I'd rather have loads of paint shame. Yeah, yeah. I'm going to officially call it that. Yeah, <laughs> all right. I'd rather mm. have loads of paint shame than have loads of grey shame. Or you can have both. Can have but just like, have both. But, yeah. but, like, but I'd rather have loads of paint because then it means that that those choices yeah. aren't so predetermined. And unless you've experimented and learned them all, and then you have a not. Yeah. I always say it's like a great painter isn't just technical skill or ability. A great painter is an amalgamation of a few things, and one of them including skill and ability and understanding. And if you're playing 40k, putting the law into it and all that kind of stuff. But one of the bedrock things of being a good painter 
in my mind and opinion, mm. is literally having a good command of paint, as in yeah. knowledge. How do they finish? How does it dry? How does it behave? How does it dilute? You know, how does it layer? Is how does it dilute? Does it create an opaque, opaque viscous uh, dilution for me really easily? How much water do I need to put into it? How much medium do I put into it? You know, if I'm trying to emulate this type of thing, do I want a more satin finish? So I know I, I can choose from these six paints because when they dry, they have a satin. That yeah. knowledge of paint. I always say it's like going into a library and imagine there's only one book on each shelf. Like if you go into a library and there's one book, you'd read that book and it'd be an instinctive choice to learn about that topic or whatever. But if you imagine if you had a shelf full of books, you knew all of them. And the next time you want to learn, uh, read a story about this, you pick up that book or you pick up this book. It's exactly the same. Mm. Like, but if you want to take that to another level, it's like you don't necessarily need to have more paint. It's just trying to break out of your cycles because even yeah. as someone who has a lot of paint, I have found myself many, many times defaulting to like a mix that I like. Yeah. yeah. And it's trying to break that cycle of I believe if you need if you need a yeah. new colour, try to think about how what other colours you could use or create instead them, yeah. of or that you already them, yeah. have, rather than going, Oh, I need to go out and buy a whole new paint. Yeah. yeah. No, I believe um a great pioneer of the hobby <clears throat> once said uh, go mental with colour. Don't know who said that. I can't remember yeah. who said that. <laughs> yeah, it was me. Yeah, uh, <laughs> but yeah, that's the yeah. other thing as well, isn't it? Just uh, like you say, with all you know, with the leather and things. Obviously, you've got space cows, um, but you can obviously you can make leather from any old skin, can't you? I was giggling. I was giggling earlier because I thought I kept thinking of how useful would leather from a sh uh, a shrew be? Not very. <laughs> not very. But all these planets would have all these creatures on that, I, that they would be utilizing for their well, production of equipment. Salamanders are the best case example of that. Yeah. So lots of marine captains and figures have capes, but salamanders have a, a, a scaled, a drake scale cape, which yeah. is the flesh of, it's no different than leather, but it's a cape of it. Does that make sense? It's so, kind of reddish so, on the inside. Yeah, exactly. It? So, and so just because that's not a predetermined part of the sculpt doesn't mean you can't imply that with the way that you paint yeah. that yeah, so surface. You could, you yeah, could yeah, paint yeah. that, 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 sort of scaled effect on the cape you know yeah. like even uh, if it was smooth and it wasn't a sculpted cape with scales on yeah, it you yeah. can still imply that by the colors that you use equally with the leather say it's a you know i'm keeping default in space marines but say it's a space marine like holster the way that you paint that can imply a myriad of different materials yeah. Yeah. rather than just if you paint it as brown leather you're going to see it's brown leather i mean how, how cool would it look to have a salamander that's got like a drake scale gun holster Mm. Or a belt around their waist, or like, or, or like. I don't think I've ever seen that. No, I haven't either. Yeah, I might give it a go. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah another okay. challenge. Well, that actually bleeds very, very nicely and segues into tip number five, which is to think differently about how you select paint for your highlights. And if you draw this like all the way down to the super most basic level, yeah. you think of just oh, add white to it. Just add white to it. Which <laughs> let's go. We can get into mm. why that desaturates your paint, and you end up with pink blood angels instead of red ones but being clever with how you're you know i don't want to get too deep into color theory or anything like that but trying to be more clever and more tactical with how you can keep saturation in your color yeah. for your highlights rather than just i'm going to add white or i'm going to add gray and something it's like tricky because you, you think of colors especially colors like red and you think well what is the correct what should the correct highlight color for red B. I don't think there is a correct. So I was just going to touch upon that. So we're very fortunate to have light that's very balanced. Okay. So a lot of things that you see in natural, natural daylight have, uh, have um, sometimes if you hold different objects in light, you'll see they've got like a white catch point or things like that. Mm. Um, but imagine if the sun was a different, projected a different, different color of light. So yes, red armor in, in daylight might potentially have like a whitish, a whitish hue, but imagine if the lighting effect from the sun in that on in that galaxy or that system was a different color. So like you 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 can you if you're trying to paint natural daylight lighting, then yes, potentially you can add sort of like those sort of tones and colors, and you can boost the color with maybe white and things like that. But I find it pastelizes colors quite a lot. Yeah. Which like we're saying about the pink on red, or like you know uh, you put that, that into blue and you get like the, the the really like sort of like. Uh, and that's before you get into the fact of miniature paint specifically tends not to be single pigment. So while, yes, you can absolutely mix paints, they tend to desaturate. The more paints you mix, yeah. the closer and closer and closer they'll get to brown. Yes, that's yeah. right. Yeah. I, I think my golden rule that I've always applied is if I'm using a color within a branch of color, and I always think of them like trees, that's the best way for me to explain it. Every branch on the, on the tree is a different color, if that makes sense. Rather than picking a color from a different branch to lighten or darken, I like using a brighter or darker color within that branch of the tree. Does that right. make sense? Yeah, yeah. So if I've got a mid-tone blue and I want to increase the vibrancy of the blue, I'll get 
a much lighter blue in the in the branch, and I'll introduce that into it to then boost the color a little. Yeah, bit, if that makes sense. Um, one of our, if you watched our paint episodes before, um, one of my favorite paints is ice yellow, which is yeah. an amazing, amazing color as a booster because you can put that into purples, greens, reds. You can put it into loads of different colors, and it adds saturation to the color, but it doesn't desaturate or pastelize, and, and it does. Because I, I hate my highest highlights being being white i just don't yeah. i like uh, when i see black armor that's got like the starkest white highlights on it even a black object like in real life like a phone for example like you'd move it in the light you move it in the light and yes it has got subtle little but the edges are not like vibrant bright white Does no that make sense right. you know like so I, I i find that really confusing when i see stuff that has like this crisp super bright white highlight on it, it just doesn't for me it doesn't emulate reality as much as maybe using other colors i always say like for black like a crow or a raven if you look at them they've got this really cool iridescent purpley blues yeah, and yeah. greens and stuff like that and i think that adds a lot more interest to it but well with, that's kind of what i'm getting at because before you get to like the brightest highlights i'm talking about even in you know your middle stage highlights or your first introductory highlights when you see we've spoken about this on the critique clinic before is like when you see black armor as your example you'll often see that people tend to make the first highlight a gray which yeah. is effectively adding white into the black yeah but what you'll often see on a lot of you know very very intricate pieces is there'll be blue tones or purple yeah. tones or something else just to give it a bit of life rather than just everything being monochrome because if you applied that same logic to it's very very obvious with black but if you applied it to something else like we're saying with red yeah if you had a space marine uh like a blood angel that you highlighted with just you just added white to your Mephiston red. You're just going up with these pink highlights at the end of the day. Mm. Whereas if you was introducing yellow tones, like with the ice yellow, or if you was adding oranges and things like that, it's actually going to boost the satur It's going to make the the red look more red without getting too deep into the color theory behind yeah. that. But just adding white into everything is a fast track to desaturate things. And it also means that you end up with this weird continuity across the model because everything has been highlighted with white. And it makes kind of none of the details distinguishable from each other. Because if if the bright, say you went to full, say you've done like five highlights on every single color on a model, mm. and every single time you ended with the brightest highlight possible, which is white, you've got white highlights on everything. Yeah. It doesn't look right. All the colors tend to bleed into each other. Mm. You haven't got any distinction between the different details. Yeah, and, and and all of this, I mean, all of this is in the realms of like artistic choice as well. Like if yeah. you like using white, there's nothing. There's nothing factually wrong with you using white at all. So it can be done very, very well. Yeah, it's, it's, it can it's, be done very, very well. I, I want to caveat this with it. It's very much an opinionated statement. But all, all I would say from, from my opinion on it is that I, when I look at models that have got loads of white highlight stages and models that have got loads of uh, linear highlights within the branches of color or they've had more, they retain saturation, I automatically prefer the ones that have got more yeah. saturation if that makes sense i don't i don't like the a pastely kind of look to well, i'm, I'm mm. not even necessarily saying to ditch white for your highlights i'm just trying to get the listeners to be more conscious about when you go to place your highlights think about am i just going to use white again or is there a better color choice yeah. from the palette of colors that i have yeah i still use i mean being very amateur at it i mean that's it's something i need to work on obviously with choosing the right sort of things to use as highlights other than white to yeah. mix in with my paints. I still, it's still a bit of a, like a, a crutch kind of paint, but, but um, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm getting, I think I'm getting a bit better, especially with black, you know, it, it just add a bit of white in to make a gray and then work up from there. Yeah. yeah. But um, perhaps, yeah, perhaps I could try some blues or a bit of a purple on there. I think again that leads back to an earlier point in, in the episode about experimenting. This yeah, is, this is de this is like white is an instinctive choice. I want to make it lighter. I'll put white. In. I want of course, make it, it is. Yeah, it's black into yeah, it. Yeah. That's an instinctive muscle memory choice as a painter. And, and again, caveat in it. That's there's nothing factually wrong with that. I, I guess that's, that's a good point. Actually, I yeah. didn't actually think of this in reverse. This would also apply to shading a model yeah. of adding black. I know it's an instinctive choice. Like I want to make it darker, so I put black into it. Or I want to make it lighter, put white into it. But I think if you just pause for a second and go right. I want to brighten this red or brighten this green or brighten this purple or brighten this blue. And I'm going to try and put some of this color into it. It's a brighter color that I'm putting into it. Let's see what that does. Yeah. And it creates an amazing opportunity for you to start learning your paints and also seeing the direct result of mixing those things together. As George said, a lot of paints or most paints are multi-pigmented anyway. So, you know, uh, I, I just personally think that that gives you a greater explanation, a, a, 
I just personally think that gives you a greater exploration of paint rather than the instinctive. I'll put want to make it lighter. I'll put white in. Yeah. I'll make it darker. I'll put I'll put this. Plus, in I suppose it's having a bit of it's having it's, it's going back to that thing as well, saying having a bit of confidence to actually do it. Yeah. And not just put white into it. Yeah. Try like you say experiment. Try something new. So yeah, get the sprue out. <laughs> You yeah, can't be afraid to experiment either because like even when you're mixing it on the palette, yeah. you, can, you can see it before you put it on the model. Yeah, you don't have to use it, so, yeah, you, haven't, you know, yeah, you can still adjust things on the on the palette. You don't have to put it onto your model. Really. If you go, oh, let's try using, you know, this color instead, yeah. and you put it on the palette and you go, oh, that, that looks weird. Like, yeah. you, you haven't committed to that. Okay, you might have put a tiny little bit of paint yeah. on the palette that you're not going to use now. Whereas I still think, that. that looks weird. Ah, I'll try it anyway. Yeah. <laughs> I'll give it a go. I think that's a healthy attitude to have, though. <laughs> yeah. Every single every single light bulb moment or discovery that I've really enjoyed and, and have picked up and constantly used moving forward has been through experimentation. Yeah. Every single one. Mm. You know, um, uh, albeit... All bit, and that's from I'm purely talking about it, it, sort of experimenting. Obviously, when you have conversations with other painters uh, that have maybe done that as well, they yeah. go, oh, "Have you tried putting this color into that? Have you done yeah, this yeah. before?" And then you're like, "Oh no, I haven't. I'll give that a go." And then you try it yourself, and you're like, "Holy crap! Like that's that's like a mate, that's that's mega." Like I think, I think whether you're lifting from other people's experimentation or whether you're doing it yourself and then finding these amazing things, mm. I, I just. In in summary, with a lot of the things that we're we're talking about in the, in this episode, like I think that you should really try try paint and try do different things with it, so that you can just learn those things. Yeah. And whether you choose to carry them forward or not is obviously down to you. Whether you like the the color, the finish, or whatever, blah blah. But I think definitely, I think definitely doing that as a painter will help you grow massively. If you're listening to this podcast, there's a good chance that you're looking to take miniature painting more seriously and improve your skills. We're asked all the time by listeners of this podcast how you can paint like our artists here at Siege, and now you can learn how with our Siege Studios painting and sculpting classes. We teach a variety of fundamental and advanced techniques that are integral to the painting methodologies that we use here at Siege. Our day and weekend classes have been developed over eight years of teaching experience, developing painters from all skill levels in venues across the UK. You'll walk away with practical skills and techniques that you can take away and nurture so you can start seeing better results and grow as a painter. To book tickets to your local venue now before they sell out, head to the link in this episode's description or go to siegestudios.co.uk forward slash shop. Question of the week time. Thank you everyone for submitting your questions for question of the week. If there is a question that you have that you'd like us to answer on a future episode of the podcast, please leave it down in the comments below if you're watching on YouTube. This question comes from Pedro Gomez who says, how do you go about gap filling and is this a process you would take on your average marine? I've been using plastic cement for a while now and had to test a few because some are strong and some melt the seams and then bulge out. Uh, but I've been more reserved with my plastic cement and I'm trying to work on a sweet spot for gaps. Mm. Mini putt. Hands yeah. down. Every day of the week, twice on Sunday. Literally, mini putt. Mix up the two parts. A little bit of water just to soften it slightly. Get it to a, like, like almost like a when you're trying to you know when you I'm going to segue into some James's DIY <laughs> wall um, filling. Wait, well, when you're filling a wall and you're just trying to skim the surface with a trowel mm. and just literally fill that hole in, you get it to that similar sort of consistency in the mini putt. Get a little bit on. Use a rubber glove so that you don't get fingerprints on the model and literally get it to that consistency. Get the gap, skim it with your finger. Okay, or you can get a mini trowel. I don't know what you do with that. <laughs> bit, 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 bit of plastic cards. On the, on the 28 mil any, scale. Anyone who makes a mini trowel out of plastic card gets extra points. Um, <laughs> get get uh, get your, your plastic card mini trowel or get your rubber glove finger and then just skim that skim that surface. And then again, the really, the beauty of mini part is that then it, it dry, when it dries and the moisture from the water you put in evaporates out of it, uh, what happens is it forms almost like a hard hard surface, if that makes sense, like a, mm. like a ceramic surface. Um and then you can literally just use your use your Tamiya sanding foam or use a, a, some form of sanding to then just uh, then just soften it. Or if you really want to, you can use a brush and you can just water with it, while it's still a little bit damp. You can use a little bit of brush, a yeah. damp brush, and you can just flatten it and smooth it. Mini putt is my go-to. I wouldn't use it. I've seen people use like green stuff and yeah. stuff like that, which is good. Green stuff's good, uh, but it's harder to work. It's hard to work with. I do. I, think- I I I use it on purpose because it gives me a chance to practice a little bit, maybe a sculpting with. The, the green stuff when I'm, especially like Space Marines joints where they've got the you know they've got the soft joints because they're normally ribbed or something aren't yeah. they they've normally got a texture on them so I use it as a little bit of an excuse to practice doing some little bit of texturing and things yeah. like that. Yeah. but I have found though sometimes when you're using green stuff once it's dried you can still move the 
It's soft. It's it, soft. It can it's be a bit, bit soft. Depending on how much yellow you use in the mix, it's soft. Yeah. Enough. Blue is a hard now. Yellow yeah. is soft. It's rubbery soft. material. Yeah. 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 My yeah. answer for this actually ties into what we were talking about earlier with not like rushing certain things mm. and like it's actually more efficient overall. I think the best gap filling happens when you're building the model mm -hmm. and that is the best gap filling is not having to fill a gap. Are you saying get good? Is that what you're saying? <laughs> well, what I'm saying is spend as much time as possible. If you know that there's two prominent pieces where there's going to be a big seam, mm. dry fit the parts, yeah. see how they go together, take them apart, get some sand, you know, thousand grit sandpaper, creep up on that joint, smooth it down a little, file off a little bit extra, yeah. put them back together, test fit again, see if they go together. Okay, maybe I need to shave down a little bit here with a sharp scalpel blade and creep up on that and get a nice joint before you put them together. Because oftentimes you'll find the reason there's massive gaps on the model is because you've been like, you know, trying to get through a box of 20 tactical marines and you've been slapping them all together yeah. and you don't realize that, you know, two parts haven't pressed together. For example, with, um, you know, like the push fit uh, models that GW do sometimes where they're like, it's like a peg and then a sort of circle that yeah, it yeah. slots into. If you cut those off yeah, get them. and get rid of them entirely, yeah, yeah, the because, they, because they go together so tight, you can't actually get them to, to, to the parts to touch. Yeah. Whereas if you cut off those two peg contact points, then all of a sudden the parts, you know, yeah. butt up nicely and sit smooth together. I did that on every single Leviathan model that we done for the Hawk Lords. Every single one, mm -hmm. when, we, when I built them, all the pegs were cut off. I, I do know what, what the viewer's saying though about, uh, obviously, you know, when you put your, your plastic glue on your joint, you, you push the joints together bubbles, yeah. and you get bubbles. And uh, I, I think that's, I mean, what I've learned from that is obviously you put a little bit of glue on each side, you leave it for a few seconds because there's a chemical reaction with that glue on the plastic. And I think if you push it together too quickly, that chemical, chemical, that chemical reaction is still going on and the gases from that reaction have got nowhere else to go but yeah. ooze out of your joint. Weirdly though, that does, that can be used like tactically. It because can if be, you know, yeah, for example, but... with like cloth, um, on models like Skitari, for example, where you've got like big seams yeah. around like the cloth around their waist. Yeah, you can be quite clever. If you it. intentionally put a little bit more glue than you'd like mm. on, because when you press it together, you'll have that squeeze out and it will fill that gap. You have a disgusting, nasty, big, horrible joint. It looks like yeah. someone, it looks like a trainee with a welder put it together. <laughs> mm. <laughs> Wait for it to dry and fully cure and then go in because it's plastic like the rest of the model. You can go in with the sandpaper and you can yeah. smooth it out and get a really nice finish and it's already done the gap filling for you. Yeah, exactly. But if you don't want that to ooze, if you're not, in, if that's not intent, you don't want that to happen, perhaps leave the two pieces for a little bit longer than you would do before sandwiching with using together. that that plastic glue I, i'd advise using slightly less glue yeah like actually what you do is with a knife i always say this like with attaching the feet onto the bases or the base score the score areas. cross hatch on, yeah. the, on the joint within the within the area of the joint so the cross hatching won't be yeah, but don't, doesn't the, the the glue melt the two surfaces so when they bond it's together still, they it they still join. creates a bit of a recess yeah the glue will go into okay. and it will just form a bit of a foundation yeah. It still helps with it. It massively mm -hmm. helps. Cross hatch, it just, yeah. it just, it honestly helps hugely. Yeah. yeah. Little bonus tip if the listeners want to do some homework, look up Tamiya Extra Thin Plastic Cement. That's some great stuff as well. Uh, Hobby Hacks, this is our closing weekly tradition on the podcast as your reward for making it to the end and listening to us waffle on for an hour and a bit. Uh, you get a little hobby hack that you can implement into your painting. And as usual, James here to save the day with his hobby hacks. What have you got for us this time? So I love glazing, it's one of my favorite things. And windows, doors, that sort of thing. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Bifold doors, conservatories, yeah. you know. <laughs> got you covered, got your yeah, skylights. Yeah. So, yeah, yeah. I've got, got really got in windows. the DIY section, should have thrown it in there. Yeah, no. Um, so yeah, glazing is one of my favorite things uh, when it comes to painting. I, I love doing it on swords and armor and all these different things. Um, and uh, in the realms of efficiency, I would massively advocate that you make a, a large amount of the glaze on your palette. So you've got a lot of it rather than mm. just a tiny little bit because then you keep the consistency of the glaze the same for a longer working time, which is good. Um, it won't dry out as fast either because there's a lot of water in there because mm, it's a bigger volume. surface area and a bigger volume of it. Yep. The drying time is slower. It's science. It's better. Yeah. <laughs> so we should, this, call this, we should call this segment Science Corner. <laughs> James does science. I prefer yeah. Hobby Hack. Hobby Hacks, I think it's better. <laughs> like, yeah, yeah I'll get, I haven't got a, a, I mean, overcoat and goggles on or whatever, so it's fine. But, um, but um, so... I, I, I'm a big advocate, as anyone may know, of a hairdryer. It's one of my favorite mm. things for miniature painting. And I massively implore that you use one, not just for speed, but also for quality of paint. It's just the way it sets paint, the paint in place when you're using it. But James, what hairdryer should you use? Yeah, <laughs> don't, don't go out. 
please, before, Dyson. for those of you that are watching or listening, please don't run into yeah, yeah, into another bedroom or your, in, in raid your partner's drawers or whatever to pick out the Vidal Sassoon Ferrari volcano <laughs> yeah. hair dryer that, that they undoubtedly have for drying hair or whatever. Catching um, strays on this yeah, episode. Yeah. yeah, I would massively recommend you buy yourself the cheapest most rubbish travel hair dryer. If you're That's spending, what I did. You're spending one, yeah. more than ten pounds yeah. or ten dollars or whatever on 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 it, then then you're then you're, you're in the right uh, sort of ballpark. The um, fact that they're crap is why you want them. Uh, <laughs> I'm going to say this with a caveat because this is the test. But if anyone suffers an injury as a result of doing this, it's not my fault because I've warned <laughs> you with a caveat in advance. Your travel hair dryer on it should only have like one or two settings so it should yeah. only have like a one or a two or on fire or, yeah. or off yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> preferably not on fire you don't want to be so um so what you what you want to do is you can just test it on your hand and if if you can hold it on your hand for five ten seconds and it doesn't hurt your hand or give you or your hand isn't uncomfortable please don't burn your hand um uh, it should be fine on the surface of the model and holding it about six inches, seven inches away, something like that should be fine. Um, but what, what get into the actual hack, which is, is so like, for example, like if you heat the model, so warm the surface temperature of that mm. model above room temperature, not hot, not, not on fire, not on fire <laughs> or melting the models, uh, turning your, turning your pris, pris, pristine, like sculpted armored models into like worship, worshippers yeah. of Nurgle or something like that. They have uh, not opened the Ark of the Covenant. Yeah. They are still <laughs> ready to fight. <laughs> yeah. 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 What you, what you want to do is warm the surface temperature of that model to an above room temperature. So it is factually warmer and hotter. But the beauty of it is, is while you're glazing and working, you can load the brush, uh, take a little bit of the excess off, and then um, you can do a glaze and physically watch that glaze dry. So mm. you're rather than what I always advocate, and it's something I always uh, say as a bit of a thing on classes when we when I teach classes is, um, if you were to mop a floor, you don't take the mop out of the bucket and put it straight on the floor. You wring it out a little bit, and mm. I re recommend you do that with a brush and take a little bit of the excess off, so your brush is damp, but not like really saturated with with that glaze and what that allows you to do is you've heated the model up you load the brush take a little bit of the excess off and then you just do a glaze and you can watch that glaze dry because of the heat that's on the surface of the model gotcha so you literally are way right. more fit you're way more efficient with glazing because you're so you're not technically drying the glaze with the hairdryer you're you've this is what I've been doing. Why am I doing this? I sit there with the hairdryer blowing the paint off across the room. With the hair <laughs> so what you do is you heat the model for gotcha. right. 5, 10, 15 seconds oh, or whatever. Man. And then you literally just go glaze, 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 and you're watching it dry. Oh, this is why I only ever get second place yeah. at the local DW this is, store. This, but this goes back to what we were saying earlier about being efficient because you're getting a faster overall result because you preheated the model, which yes, did take time but you're not going back after every single glaze, putting your brush down, cleaning your brush, I'm picking up the hair. doing it totally wrong. Yeah. Such a noob. So, so just, just warm, the, warm the model a little yeah. bit when you're glazing because it means that you can, and visually as well, the beauty of that is that you're not doing a glaze, drying it, and then doing the next glaze. You do, you, you warm it, do the glaze. It's drying as you You do. watch it dry and the beauty of that is your attention as a painter is focused on the model. It's, yeah. So if, so, so good. a lot, sometimes people will glaze, you'll, keep glazing something to get it seamless or smooth or soft or whatever. Sometimes if you glaze, you, you could put on too much glaze and hair dry and then it creates a tide mark or something. The beauty mm. of this is that you can do a bit of glaze. You can warm it, glaze, watch it dry, glaze, watch it dry, glaze, watch it dry. And you can incrementally make the change with your doing with the glaze or insinuate that color. Think yeah. of the cowling on a plasma. You could literally heat the plasma gun do the glaze, a couple of glaze layers and sketch that and you'll see that colour starting to sketch onto the surface. So yeah, heat the model a little bit. Right, is, yeah. that's, a, that's the best hack ever. I, I, think I, I can't so wait far. for the comments. Instructions unclear turned my rhino into goo. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> I know. <laughs> I now <laughs> collect Nurgle. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I had an into a space marine army. I'm now a death guard. You owe me an army. Yeah. I'm definitely yeah. going to try once, that. Once again, That's, please, please, please. And I will say as a caveat, please do not use a crazy Vidal Sassoon, like crazy over the top hairdryer. Mm. And the last thing, just to touch on about hairdryer usage, which I think is something that a lot of people don't instinctively do. A hairdryer sometimes have like a funnel on the end. Okay. That's detachable. Um, that focuses the blast of air out the hairdryer and actually makes it hotter because it's focusing the, the, the flow of the air out the, out the hairdryer. It's like a Death Star. All the lasers. <laughs> I'm never going to look at my hairdryer the same now, Paul. It's brilliant. Yeah, I'm gonna, yeah. Yeah. Pointing it at the moon going, why is it not working? Instantly yeah. the yeah. Death Star pops yeah. into my head. And I think, That's exactly, yeah. exactly it. But like, yeah. so that funnel is great for drying hair uh, because it focuses it and actually speeds up the drying action of the, of the, of the hairdryer. Um, 
but it's not good for miniatures because it, it also focuses the air onto the position on the miniature, heats it up even hotter, which potentially... You don't really can... want... Hot, we, we're not using the hair dryers because they're hot. We want the, to control like, an air blast. The water doesn't mm -hmm. really... Need, it's different, obviously, if you're like with the, the hobby hack of like trying to warm up the model a little bit. But generally speaking, when you're using a hair dryer to dry your models, you don't want the air to be hot. You just want to be circulating air onto the model. Yeah. And, and I would advocate taking that cone off. So take the cone off the end of the hairdryer or the funnel or whatever you want to call it. Take that off the front. And while you're using the hairdryer, fluctuate from hot as in on the model to off. So you're using it, you're fluctuating. You're not holding it on for dear life, like blasting the thing. Fluctuate it while you're using it because it'll go hot, cold, hot, cold. And that shift in temperature between hot and cold, it will, it, it's not like a suction action, but what it does is it literally just, it, you'll see the paint just, almost like pull in as it dries and that'll just help you if you're fluctuating it as well. So yeah, heat the model for glazing. It will save you time. It's more efficient and you can control the glaze as you're doing it a bit better as well. Brilliant. Okay. On that note, thank you everyone for listening to this week's episode of Paint Perspective. If you'd like to support the show, you can do so with our Patreon, which is linked in the description of this episode. And also you would have heard a bunch of ads throughout this episode for all of the wonderful products, but don't forget to subscribe to the newsletter so you can get yourself a free PDF tutorial. Thank you, everyone. We will catch you next week.